Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Worship with Aldersgate. My name is Dee Kymack. I'm a certified lay minister and will be leading you through worship today. Pastor Rachel is on vacation, but she'll be back next week, and she has missed everyone, so she's looking forward to being back with you next week. Today, we have a special guest preacher. The Reverend Michael Reed is visiting us and will preach, and his question, you need to be thinking about before we get there, is why is it so hard to love other people? So I'm looking forward to the answer to that question when he preaches. So if you could center yourselves, and let's be about worship. All right, good morning, everyone. Folks who are in the room and folks who are visiting us via Zoom, please stand as you're able. If you're in the room and join us in singing our first hymn, Yezu, Yezu, fill us with your love. And if you're at home, please join in singing whatever way is comfortable for you. Let me start that over. Ready? <laughs> And D, I don't know if I need to adjust the, uh, the cameras at all. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Michael Reed. Um, I attend this church uh, every uh, Sunday with my family. And in a minute, we're going to invite up my daughter, Fia, for children's time. But I just wanted to say it's a delight to be with you. Some of you may know this. Some of you may not. I am actually an ordained United Methodist pastor. How about that? Yeah, right? <laughs> Hiding in plain sight, uh, I've been on a sabbatical year, a transition year, and then this coming July, I'll be appointed as a pastor at Rolling Ridge Retreat Center and Conference Center. Uh, so I won't be serving a church, but I will be doing pastoral ministry in that context, and I'll be able to uh, still attend here on Sundays with you. So that's a little bit more about me. Yeah. I'm going to invite my daughter, Fia. Fia, do you want to come up? We're going to have children's time. You're the only child here today. So hopefully this will go well. Wow. Can you come on up? Woo! Hey. Say hi, everybody. Yeah. Um, this is my daughter, Fia, spelled F-I-A. Can you say F-I-A? And how old are you, Fia? How old are you? She's two years old. Uh, and Fia, like all two-year-olds, is learning a lot of things. We're learning about sharing. We're learning about uh, using our indoor voice and all sorts of things. But one of the things that we learn a lot about is how to show love. Show love. That's what the, the theme is this morning. 
And we like to watch a lot of Daniel Tiger, who's an animated little tiger in the tradition of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And he has this one song about how different ways that we can show love. So let's see if we can remember this. It's a lot to ask as you're the center of attention. But you remember there's a Daniel Tiger song? Fia, look at me. Fia, Fia. There's a Daniel Tiger song that goes, Making something is one way to say... <laughs> I love you. Too much attention, too much pressure. Making something is one way to say I love you. And what's cool about um, little kids is they're learning that love is not just a feeling, right? It's not just something we feel, that we do feel uh, love for the people in our lives, our mommies and daddies and parents and teachers and all sorts of people, our friends. But it's not just a feeling, it's also something we do, right? We show love. Uh, for those of you who are grammarians, love is both a noun and a verb. It's sometimes best as a verb, the way that we act. So there's different ways we can show love. We can make something. We can give a gift. We can give a hug or a high five. We can... Um, what else is there? What other ways can we show love to the people in our lives? Anybody else? We can cook stuff. Yes. She's Southern. I agree. Southern. <laughs> We can pray for them. We can use our words. We can give them compliments, words of affirmation, as Gary Chapman would say. Flowers. Flowers. Gifts. Visit. Okay, visit. Also, acts of service, doing things for others is a great way to show our love. Um, spending time, right? Sometimes the gift of our time is enough. There's all sorts of different ways that we show love. And uh, from the littlest stage, we're learning to show our love by what we do. And so for you big kids in the room, the message for you this children's time is to remember that love isn't just something we feel, but something we do. And sometimes we know that we love people, right? We feel it in our hearts, but we have to make sure that we're translating that into practical application and action so that our love can be uh, seen in the world and so our light can shine, okay? Let's say a prayer and we'll finish up our children's time. Can you close your eyes? We're going to say a prayer, okay? We're going to close, hold our hands and close our eyes. We're going to say, dear God, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you show us love and that you teach us how to love others. May we love the people in our lives this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the children is dismissed towards Sunday school, the children's time, and the rest of you will move on with the service. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jan Condry, and I'm happy to be sharing the scripture reading with you today. Our reading comes from John, chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Okay, are we on? I think it's me again. All right. Should have looked closer at the order of service. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another, just as I have loved you, so you also should love one another. Here's a question. Why is it so difficult to love other people? All right, that was the question of the day. Uh, and in our gospel text this morning, you can see it uh, on the screen behind me, 
Uh, on, in our gospel text this morning, Jesus give, tells his disciples that they ought to love each other. In fact, Jesus doesn't just tell them, Jesus commands it, right? A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. And that, if you ask me, that seems like a pretty good idea, am I right? In fact, I'm pretty sure if you asked anyone, it would seem like a pretty good idea. You could stop random strangers on the street and just say, hey, excuse me, just got a question for you. Do you think it's a good idea for people to love one another? Everybody's going to say yes, right? Who could possibly say no, right? We all think that love is wonderful. Think about all the things that, um, think about all the things that people say about love, right? We say that love conquers all. We say that, that love makes the world go round. We say that you can fall in love or send love, that you can believe in love because love will find a way, which is pretty impressive when you consider the fact we also think that love is blind. <laughs> think about the songs on the radio. You turn on the radio, you're going to hear the Beatles singing, all you need is love. You're going to hear Celine Dion singing about the power of love. If you were alive in the 1970s, you would have heard people talking about, you know, if I could teach the world to sing in perfect harmony, I'd like to buy the world a Coke and keep it company. Do you remember that? If I could teach the world to sing. We love love. That's my point, right? We teach our children, as we saw today, or did the children's time, that love is an essential thing. Love is the most important thing. Just about everybody thinks that loving one another is a good idea, which is odd because just about everybody is bad at doing it. Am I right? You ever think about that? Everybody wants to be more loving. Everybody wants to be more kind. Everybody wants to live in a world where people are more loving, where people are more kind, where we all just get along. So if everybody wants that kind of world, why isn't the world more like that? I mean, just think about, um, think about the way that we live our lives. Think about our personal relationships. Think about our neighborhoods. Think about our, 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 our workplaces, our schools. Think about all of the things that are going on at a national and an international level, not even to mention the ways that we talk about one another on social media and cable news, right? Not a whole lot of love, is there? So why isn't the world the way it ought to be, if we can all agree? Why is it so hard to love one another? Well, I've been thinking about that, and I've been coming up with some reasons for uh, why we find it difficult to love one another. It seems to me if you've got an issue, you've got to find where the breakdown, where the problem lies. And so I've been coming up with possibilities, possible reasons for why it's difficult, and I've come up with three, three reasons for why we find it so difficult to love one another. And this morning, I want to share them with you. In fact, the very first reason for why it might be difficult to love one another is the one I think secretly we're all rooting for at some level. The reason it's difficult to love other people might just be other people, right? <laughs> other people are the reason I can't love other people. I mean, have you met other people, right? <laughs> There's a, um, a Peanuts cartoon I like, you know, Peanuts with Charlie Brown and Snoopy. Uh, and in this particular cartoon, Linus, and remember Linus is the philosophical one with the comfort blanket. Linus has been accused of being a grump, of being, uh, you know, a little bit of a misanthrope, not really liking humanity. And, and Linus replies by saying, oh, no, 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 I love humanity. It's people I can't stand. <laughs> And I think he speaks for a lot of us, right? In the big picture, sure, the general concept, loving each other, great. It's when things start to get specific that I run into problems, right? Think about some of the specific people in your life. There's, um, I don't know, you just start thinking, maybe there's that one, one guy who always has to prove that he's just a little bit smarter than everyone else. Or that somebody in your life that always has something critical to say, it's never right, it's never good enough for her no matter what you do, right? You've got to meet somebody, you meet somebody who just makes everything about them, good or bad, it all revolves around them. Or somebody that even when good things are happening, is just so negative, they're always complaining, they're always finding the worst possible spin on the situation, 
right? It's your boss who makes convoluted, contradictory requests upon your work and your time. It's your friend who just doesn't see how much work you're putting into the relationship to keep things going, right? It's that one person and that one really annoying thing that they do. You know what I'm talking about, right? And, and, and you know that they don't really mean to do it on purpose, but how could they not be aware? And it just drives you up the wall, right? Now, maybe some of you are sitting here and thinking, well, you know, not, not me. That's not really accurate to my life. And I would say if that's you, humbly, respectfully, maybe you just don't get out very much, right? Because if, <laughs> if you live enough life, you are going to come across people who test your patience and push your buttons, And along comes Jesus, and Jesus says to us, now you all have to love each other. And you kind of want to go, I'm sorry, Jesus, but it's too late because we've already met, right? (laughs) If those other people were just a little bit easier to love than Jesus, I would certainly do my part in loving them. Of course, when you think about it, that excuse is not going to really work on Jesus, is it? Because presumably Jesus knows all the same people you do and likes them anyway, so you're kind of stuck. Love one another. What to do? Well, I mentioned that um, I've been appointed to Rolling Ridge Retreat and Conference Center in North Andover, and I was there this week, and I got to sit in on a session about, oh, yeah, there's some hand claps for Rolling Ridge. It's a great place. Um, Really close by, too. Methodist, United Methodist. Um... I was sitting in this week on some sessions on spiritual companioning or spiritual direction, which is when you um, sit with another person or sometimes more than one person, and you engage in deep spiritual listening, deep listening. And one of the key principles of spiritual direction, spiritual uh, companioning, is that you're listening not just for what's happening at the surface, are you, but you're trying to go down deep. You're trying to listen for what's going on below and behind and underneath what the other person is saying, the emotional subtext, if you will, the, all of the parts of the iceberg below the surface, below the waterline. You're really listening to what's going on. And that is such a good uh, principle, isn't it, for when we have to love other people, especially difficult people? Because isn't it true that so much of, of, of what we say and what we do is really about something deeper? Sometimes it's about something else entirely. There's something down deep, and you've got to find the root cause, the, the true emotion, the, the hidden values that are buried there, or else you'll, you'll constantly just be blown around by the symptoms happening up at the surface. Does that make sense? This is, the, um, this is something that I've, I've been uh, learning to do, and when I do it, I begin to see like Jesus wants me to see, right? I, I start to look at the people around me, and that person that person who's just so negative, so complaining all the time, I begin to see that what's really happening underneath, that there's a deep hurt buried deep within, isn't there? Some deep pain that they just cannot dislodge from their soul for whatever reason. And all of the other things that are happening, all the other things they're talking about are really just ways of talking about that deep pain, right? Or you come, to, come across somebody who's just pushy, who's intrusive, right? And, and you start to ask, what's really happening here? And you begin to see that this person, uh, they're, 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 they're deeply insecure, aren't they? They're looking for a little recognition, a little attention. Okay. Or take somebody, take somebody with, um, let's say, with extreme political opinions. Yeah, right? Okay. Well, let's not take that. Let's not do that. No, but just for a minute. Stay with me. Take somebody with extreme political opinions, right? Somebody who's, whose ideas are equal parts bizarre and cruel. I find very often, and somewhat paradoxically, that people like that, people with extreme positions, they're very often people who are deeply, deeply afraid. Now, here's my point. It is very difficult to love someone with extreme opinions, isn't it? But it is much easier to let your heart go out to someone who is afraid. Why? Because I've been afraid. I can know what that feels like. I can relate on that level. Or, 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 or take the person, uh, the other people, you start thinking, you say, well, I, I know what it's like to, to need a little recognition, a little support, and yeah, I can't agree with the ways that they're going about it, but I, I certainly know what that feels like, or, 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 or I've had deep pain in my heart that's just lodged in there, and I can't let it go, and I, I know that need for healing, that inner release, and, and so yeah, I, I, I can't always agree with your behaviors, but I can identify what's going on deep down within. I can love that part of you. I can have a little bit more patience, a little compassion, a little curiosity, a little hope, 
that wasn't there before. And all of a sudden, difficult people just get a little easier to love. So see if you can do that this week with the difficult people in your life. What's really going on? Look down deep, because very often we can find a value that's positive. We can find an emotion that's relatable. We can find something that helps us to learn how to love. You get it? First thing, maybe the problem is other people. But watch out, because once you look at that first thing, and once you start going deep, take care, because the second thing comes up uh, right quick behind it. Maybe the problem is you, right? Sometimes when you start looking down deep, you do that deep listening. You say, okay, Holy Spirit, teach me what's going on. Sometimes the finger comes back pointing at you, right? There's this lovely story about G.K. Chesterton, who's a... Um, a British intellectual of the last century. And apparently the story goes that Chesterton was invited to write an essay for some newspaper, and the, the newspaper had asked a whole bunch of literary minds, cultural critics, smart people to answer the question, what's wrong with the world, right? So they all had to write essays, what's wrong with the world? And Chesterton had the shortest uh, answer by far, it wasn't an essay, it was barely a sentence. He wrote to the editorial board of the newspaper, he says, dear sirs, what is wrong with the world? I am, sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. Do you see what he's saying? I can relate. I think there's something true there. When I look out into the world and I see all of the things in the world that I do not like, I see the world's anger and its alienation, its, its boredom, its violence, its despair. When I look and I'm really honest with myself, isn't it true that I can find at least the roots and seeds and aspects of all of those things out there in here? I can find a lot of those things that I don't like in me, it's like that line from Solzhenitsyn where he says, the dividing line between good and evil runs through every human heart. In other words, the world is not divided into bad people and good people. You know, those people over there, they're evil and, and we're pretty good, but we're trying to love them. That's not how it is. It's true that each one of us can say, I am part of the problem. Now, good news, it's also true that we can say, I am part of the solution. But certainly we can say that sometimes I am what's getting in the way of loving other people. This is the brilliant insight of the Christian gospel, isn't it? This is why Jesus tells us to examine ourselves before we go judging other people. So the next time you find yourself feeling upset, sullen, something's going on, very often those are indicators there's something going on in you, right? When you just can't let something go or you have this disproportionate reaction to some little thing, that means something's happening in here, isn't it, right? So you go deep and you say, you know what's really happening here? I just didn't get my way and I'm mad about that. And that happens to all of us, right? Or, or what's really going on here? This person didn't give me the recognition that I thought that I deserved. And maybe I should examine my priorities and, and, and my expectations, right? Or, or maybe you've been guilty of doing what, what we all do from time to time, which is assuming that your little rules of decorum and polite behavior are somehow the universal laws of the cosmos and these other people aren't getting with your program. We all do that. And you have to say, okay, I can't control other people, but I can work on me. That doesn't mean, by the way, that those other people aren't responsible for their own actions or their part in the conflict or whatever else is going on. Surely, surely, that's also true. But God wants you to start with you. Am I right? And I'm just throwing this in here. This is not in the notes. But when we don't do this, oh, when we don't do this, the results are hellish. The fires of hell just kindle a spark and grow and grow. I woke up to the news this morning, maybe some of you did, that an 18-year-old white gunman went to a black neighborhood and opened fire. And just abhorrent, the hatred that grows and burns, it has nothing to do with the Christian gospel, nothing to do with the laws of love. And we fully expect that that young man will face the judgment of God. We pray for our, um, the people that are affected, those families. We pray for our black brothers and sisters. And we have to resolve ourselves again and again to fight hatred wherever we find it and to start with us because that's where God has told us to begin, to root out hatred and find the love of Christ. Sometimes the problem is us. This is why Jesus teaches us again and again to examine our souls. This is why again and again our spiritual mothers and fathers teach us to repent of our sin this is why all of the saints and all of the mystics tell us that our life will go best when we try, we resign from trying to be the CEO of the universe and let God take a turn for the change, right? 
We start with us. We look with him. So if you're having issues with somebody else, ask yourself, honestly as you can, how much of this is me? How much of this is me? That's the second thing. Maybe the problem is me. But there's a third thing. A third thing isn't there. I said there were three. There's uh, the first option, maybe the problem is other people. Second option, maybe the problem is me. And if you're paying attention, you're probably thinking, well, what else could there be? Right? We've covered other people and they've covered us. You know, Jesus talks about love one another. There seems to be two principal parties involved, me and other people. How could there be a third thing? Well, the third thing I think is hidden in plain sight. It's hidden right at the end of verse 34. It's up on the screen. Just as I have loved you. Oh, no, sorry, I missed it. Yep, there you go, Bobby. Let's put up the yellow there. So this is the command, right? You love one another. There are three things there, right? Who can find the third thing? You love one another. Sometimes the problem is you. That's me trying to hold up the commandments. Sometimes the problem is the other people. What's left? Love. Maybe the problem is love. Now you say, how in the world could the problem be love? Well, I think Jesus answers that question. Look at the very next line. Jesus says, just as I have loved you, so you must also love. In other words, in other words, the only way that we could ever be capable of loving other people the way that God intends is if we use not our love, but Christ's love, if we can learn to love like Jesus. And I want to suggest to you that often when we fail to love one another, often when there's a breakdown, it's because we've got a hold of the wrong type of love. We've got a hold of our own humanistic love that, is, that, that hits a limit at the point of rationality or reciprocity or some other conditioned uh, response, and what we really need to go the distance is the love of God, the love divine, Christ's love. There's a story in my family, my extended family, about my father-in-law, who's a wonderful man, spiritual man, a Roman Catholic, and he is a, um, a dude from Brooklyn, just Brooklyn all the way. And uh, he's also a Eucharistic minister at his church, which means he takes the sacrament after it's been consecrated, takes it out into the world to give it to, you know, the shut-ins and infirms and the elderly and so forth. And there's this story um, in, the, in the family lore about this one time that, you know, just the kids were, sorry, Elena, my wife, the kids were a mess and traffic was awful and New York City's just bearing down and he's running late and he gets to the church and the whole thing is just stressful and he comes, run, you know, moving up the middle of the the aisle of the church to, to get there. And the person who's in charge of the Eucharistic ministers, these are volunteers, the person who's in charge just absolutely tears them out, just tears them a fresh one, gives them an earful. Why? Because my father-in-law is not wearing a tie. And how could you possibly, and just goes after him for not wearing a tie. My father-in-law can feel the stress building, the blood pressure rising, soon there's gonna be smoke out of his ears. And he stops and he takes a breath and he thinks to himself, all I can do, he thinks to himself, all I can do is let the light of Christ shine through me. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let the light of Christ shine through me. So he takes another breath, and he takes his earful, takes the sacrament, and he goes out and he brings the light of Christ out into the world. And I love that story because sometimes... That's all, but that's the best thing you can do. Because you know, if, if I respond with my own strength, my own power to whatever's going on, I will never going to make it. So I'm going to open myself up to the possibility of heaven's purpose. I'm going to become a channel, a conduit, a means of grace for others. I'm going to let the light of Christ shine through me. I'm going to let the love of God flow through me. It's going to have to be God's love, not mine. So I open myself up. You know, when you do that, there's not always a huge change immediately in the world around you. Like the next time my father-in-law showed up, he was wearing a tie, right? Because sometimes you have to do that. But what always changes every time is you. You will always change when you allow yourself to be uh, a vector for God's love. There's this verse I love in Ephesians. It says, everything exposed, by, ex everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes light. In other words, when the light of God shines through you, you yourself become a light visible to the highest heavens. 
When the love of God flows through you, you know that you are loved and you know it deep down into your bones. And once God's love flows through you and you know that you're loved, that changes everything, right? Other people's issues aren't such a big deal anymore. So what if you didn't get all the recognition you thought you deserved? So what if you didn't get your way? I'm a beloved child of God. And that's what centers me. That's what grounds me. And your own issues, and we all have issues, well, those things lose their power on you. Your fear, your insecurity, your ego, whatever it is, it can be healed. It can be released in the love of God that is now flowing through you because it's God's love, not yours. It's God's power, not yours. Can you picture what the world would be like, that kind of community that would become possible? Can you even imagine if we all did that? Well, the New Testament sure can. The New Testament is actually full of commands about one another. One another commands are everywhere. The love one another command is the first and the greatest, Jesus tells us. But there are lots and lots of them, and they all become possible. They all get unlocked as the love of God flows through us. Just listen to this list. The Bible tells us to love another, yes, but also to encourage one another, accept one another, care for one another, honor one another, bear one another's burdens, be kind, forgive, show hospitality, teach, speak truthfully, belong to one another, and even lay down your lives for one another. It's amazing. That's the kind of world that becomes possible when we open ourselves up to the light and the love of Jesus Christ, when we can see people not just as they are, but as who God intends them to be. And we're committed to loving them long enough until they get there, and we do too. That's what happens, Jesus says. By this, Jesus says, all people shall know that you are my disciples when you love one another. Amen. May that be true of us. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you as people who fail so often to do the things we ought to do, and we do the things we do not wish to do. And so all of it we come and say again and again, fill us with your love, fill us with your power, your strength, your beauty, your courage. May we love one another, and by this may all people know that we are yours. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Let's all, if you're in the room, stand as you're able and sing our responsive hymn, They'll Know We Are Christians By Our Love. And if you're at home, please sing whichever way is comfortable for you. Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. By our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other. We will Offering. Anyone is in the room, there's a plate out by the front door if you're able to give. If you're online, Susan is dropping a link now. We are always blessed and humbled by the generosity of our Aldersgate friends and family. We thank you. Announcements. Next Sunday is Super Sunday. We'll be celebrating and learning about the American Red Cross. 
That's the only announcement I have. Does anybody else have anything? Okay. Um, if Susan is sending us pastoral prayers. So now it's time for the prayers of the people. These are the prayers that, thank you, we have in our hearts that God knows. Some of them have been shared, some of them not. We have a sort of a standard list. We are always praying for those struggling with or in recovery from addiction, for those with mental illness, depression, and anxiety, for Marie LaRose's friend, Marie Patrice Mass, in hospice care, for those grieving loss, for the Wilkinson and Russo families, for Sally Meredith's friends, Carol and Jean, with significant health challenges, for Betty Webb's friend, Esther, chemo treatments, for the children displaced by war, for wisdom for world leaders, for those with no one to pray for them, for all of the victims of gun violence, for Sarah LaMonica's son, Bob, facing surgery on Thursday. She also asks for prayers for Michelle in the hospital in DC. And there are many joys among us today for Pastor Michael's appointment to Rolling Ridge and that he and his family can still join us for worship. For the Fishers send prayers of gratitude for Michael preaching for the first time today. Prayers of gratitude for all those leading worship and traveling mercies for the Fishers flying home. At this time, let's pray together the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And until we all meet again, may God hold each of you in the palm of his hands. Thank you. Let's all stand and join in singing the closing hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. And if you're at home, sing how you feel comfortable. Let's go ahead and sing out to the Lord. Thank you. I did pay.